to Brian Simmons today. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus. Come on, on a Wednesday night, you got a little bit of fire in you here. Give me a J. Give me an E. Give me an S. Give me a U. Give me an S. What's that spell? What's that spell? Say the name again. <laughs> All right, thank you for putting up with me. Have a, have a seat, everybody. Can we give our worship team a big hand? They're just incredible tonight. <laughs> Dripping with the oil of God all the way from Malaysia, bro. Come on, I remember you from the School of Acts. Now you're just doing the book of Acts here, aren't you? <laughs> Tremendous. I want to thank Pastor Nick for a warm welcome here, and of course, Pastor Glenn. You know, I had the most wonderful conversation with him. I doubt that he's watching tonight because he's, uh, he's suffering in Orlando. But um, I had tremendous conversation with your pastor the other day, and uh, we were discussing these meetings. And, man, I just realized how fortunate I am, first of all, to have him as a friend and that you are to have him as your pastor. So even though in absentia, let's give them a big hand. Pastors Glenn and Denise and Nick and Patty and all the pastoral team here as well. Tremendous. This is definitely one of the favorite places in the whole world for me. I love being back here and, and uh, Pastor Glenn mildly rebuked me for staying away for so long, but uh, we promise to come back uh, and be with you as God opens that door in 2014. Well, I, I just really feel a burning in my heart tonight to share with you. And if I get a little bit rowdy, it was those three Red Bulls I drank before I came into the room. No, that's not exactly true. But uh, I, the fire of God is just in my heart. And uh, it actually happened in the Jesus movement about 42 years ago, and it just never evaporated. I'm sorry. No, I'm not really sorry anymore. Uh, it's, just, it's just real. Jesus is real. He was real with me in the jungle. He was real with me when we fought uh, demons and, and the principalities over uh, that, that region. He was real when we lost everything in our canoe accident, and he was real when we nearly lost our child joy by that snake bite. I'm telling you, he was real when we hit the concrete jungle of New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, you know that, that uh, metropolis over there where I was told when I came here, you're never going to succeed. A church you know, led by somebody like you won't succeed because Yale is right there, and the, the elitism, and the intellectualism, and here you're bringing Holy Ghost. You're bringing gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, and intense intercession and worship that, that uh, takes you somewhere. They said it just won't succeed there. Well, they were wrong. God is right all the time. I feel Connecticut is ripe for revival. Tragedy has struck this state, but God is about to send a tsunami of His love and a tsunami of His glory. And God's going to, to turn this whole thing around. Now, I want you to say, and I want you to mean it, because I'm going to make you repeat it until you do mean it. I am a fire starter. Okay, now let's stand. I know you've been up and down. But uh, during my six-hour teaching tonight, you'll be able to sit down all you want. But for right now, I want you to say, I am a fire starter. I am a fire starter. You are a fire starter. You know that? I may just prophesy over you before the night's over. How about right now? Lift your hands up to God. I release over you in the name of Jesus. Fresh fire all over you. You're going to light fires. You're going to light fires in places nobody else will even go. You're going to go into college campuses. You're going to go into coffee shops. Starbucks is going to see the glory of God through your ministry. You're going to ignite youth groups. It's going to start out like you're going to get invitations in youth groups. You're going to say, but God, I want, to, I want the pulpit. I want to preach to churches. But I see God really stirring your heart to be a fire starter and a lover for these broken high school kids 
kids and, and middle school kids. And uh, God's going to use you. He's going to ignite something in you. And before the weekend is over, He's going to confirm it to you with a dream and or visitation. Receive it right now. Receive fresh fire. Thank you, Lord. Now, say it again. I am a fire starter. We didn't come here to have a good meeting. We came here to light a fire. Is that all right? We need the raw, fresh, undiluted, right out of heaven, glory fire. We don't need it manufactured, hyped up. We don't need a religious version. We don't need a diluted version. We don't need your version or my version. We need His real, fresh fire falling upon our hearts. Now say it again. I am a fire starter. Guess what I want to speak on tonight? I want to speak on you are a fire starter. So tell the person next to you, even if they're a little strange, tell them you are a fire starter. God, you're, you know what? You're a troublemaker to the enemy is what you are. You're somebody that, that just, that cannot take status quo. Why did you come out on a Wednesday night? What made you leave your couch, your, your television, high def, you know, whatever you were going to do tonight? What was it? I'm telling you what it was. It was the Holy Spirit inside of you that says, I don't know for sure if something's going to happen, but it just might. So I think I'm going to show up just in case. Just in case we're wrong, God might just puncture the darkness over Greenwich and release something fresh here on a Wednesday night. It may spill all the way over to the bubble where the high school kids are. Are they still over there? Dude, I, we ought to go crash it. Wouldn't that be wild? <laughs> oh, my. You know, the day of, of dull, boring, predictable, going by the bulletin church services are about to end. Our predictability is going to cease. We're going to have cessationism of our predictability. God is going to move the church into a spontaneity. What are you going to do when fire falls? How can you contain the wind? What are you going to do when the deluge begins to pour on you? And the glory begins to erupt in our midst. You are a fire starter. You're going to start fires in your family. You're going to start fires at your office. You're going to start fires in your church. I know a, a prophet friend of mine had a, this amazing vision of Jesus like in a church service like this. He was walking through the church lighting matches and just throwing matches to the right and to the left. Jesus himself lighting fires and the leadership of the church was coming behind him, blowing them all out, putting them all out. Jesus wants fire in his house. He wants the raw, real, true, authentic fire. And if it's not raw, real, true, and authentic, I'm out of here. I want the real every bit as much as you do. And I'm a little bit excited. Uh, the one Red Bull that I had, no, it wasn't really even half a can. But anyway, I I'm excited to be here tonight. One more time before you sit down, I am a fire starter. All right, have a seat and open your Bible to Psalm 8. And as you find your way to the book of Psalms, I want to remind you about the Passion Translation. Uh, I've been accused of having passion. And uh, actually, the, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, but the Lord told me years ago through a, an encounter, He said, there's an angel that goes with you wherever you go. And, the and He gave me the name of the angel. The name of the angel was Passion and Fire. His name was Passion and Fire. And uh, we had a uh, radio program, I remember, years ago. I doubt that anybody would ever remember that. But I do, because I produced it and did it for I don't know how many years. But it was called Passion for Jesus. And I believe God wants to restore passion to His church. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but I think in your marriage, you could use a little bit of that. And in your heart, you need the flame to overflow. You need a, something, uh, something from the very deepest recesses, caverns of our soul. We need fire. Like Jeremiah said, there's fire locked up in my bones. You know, something that makes our blood boil with, with passion. Uh, you know what the name uh, David really means? 
What's David, the King David in the Bible, what does David mean? It would probably be good for you to say you don't know because what you think it means, it isn't. Because the common teaching about David, Dabi in the Hebrew, Dabi, is that it means beloved. Oh, isn't that sweet? But you know, Dabi is the word used for a pot that boils over. It's, so, it's it, the closest English word to the, to the name Dabi is passionate. He was passionate when everybody else hid under their trees and, and with Saul's, uh, you know, lethargy. David picked up five stones, bro, a slingshot. He went out against the enemy because he had a passion for God at 17. He outdid all of Saul's mighty men. How are you going to gather 400 mighty men if you are not a passionate warrior yourself? And let me take it a step further since I'm on this, this you know, tipping over sacred cows to make holy hamburger. Uh, Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Do you know what Bethlehem means? It would be good to say no. You see... Uh, we got it all wired. We got it all figured out. We've been to Bible college. We've read our Bibles. We even have a Zondervan study Bible that has Bible notes. That's great. But Bethlehem. Beth is house, of course. And the common teaching is bread, the house of bread. And indeed, Lechem does mean bread. However, Lechem is a homonym. Somebody say, what is a homonym? A homonym is an English word that has multiple meanings. It's spoken the same, but it can mean a number of things. We have a lot of them in English. Hebrew is full of homonyms. What if the other meaning of lechem is what it really means? And for 2,000 years, we've missed out. Because I've been to Bethlehem. I'm going to be there again in a few weeks. And you're all invited to come. It would be great to send uh, Pastor Nick with us. It would be great if you could come and join us in Israel this year. You'd love it. We'll bring you back alive. But I've been to, to Bethlehem, and it, it is not a place of bread. There is, it, it's hilly and rocky. There's no way you would grow grain or wheat. A, a valley would be the place, the house of bread. But Laham is the Hebrew word for a warrior, the house of warriors. Where, what's the city of David? Bethlehem. And where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. What if the whole time... This is why they expected Jesus to overthrow Rome, the Roman rule. Why they expected him to come and set up a messianic kingdom. Because he was to be born in the house of warriors. Like David, he would set up a dynasty. And he so disappointed them, didn't he? Well, you can keep the house of bread if you want, and that's fine, and it's true. There's nothing wrong with that. But add that ingredient of warrior to it. Is that okay? So we translated Song of Songs. We translated Luke and uh, Psalms, which I'm going to read a little bit out of tonight in my five-hour teaching. And, and then uh, we, we did Letters from Heaven, which is some of Paul's epistles. And while I'm speaking, uh, I just clicked yes to my publisher. We did a final check on the cover and the contents. And the book of Proverbs is going to be printed starting, I think, tomorrow. They'll probably take two days to print the thousands of copies that are going to be needed. And then they're going to put them in a truck and ship them for three or four days to get to our warehouse. And by the end of this month, uh, Proverbs will be available. And uh, thou shalt buy the book of Proverbs. <laughs> you would become a wise person if you did that. A proverb a day keeps the devil away, and you just need to really study the book of Proverbs. And uh, I finished John, and it's sent to the publisher, and I'll go through a four professional edits and a very detailed process before we print that, uh, hopefully in January. Okay. The glory of God. The fire that he wants to start in Greenwich is going to come out of you. The mentality that, that something has to fall upon us is an old covenant mentality. It's within us. I was in Australia recently. I had a supernatural dream. And in the dream, I, was, I saw myself in the dream going to all the nations of the earth and having meetings. And I was teaching on the new covenant reality. I had never taught anything like this before. But I saw me doing it in a dream. And I was taking notes on me in a dream, bro. It's getting good when, when you take notes on it. And I remember waking up and I wrote down the, the components of that dream and the teaching of a new covenant reality. And the essence is this. 
If, it, if it's exterior, it's old covenant. If it's from the inside out, it's new covenant. And Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, the glory didn't come upon him. It shone from within him. It shined from his innermost being. And we carry in our earthen vessel a glorious treasure, priceless treasure in our jar of clay. And Christ in us is the hope of glory. You don't wait to heaven to get glory. You have it now. You have this glory fire burning in you now. You have every spiritual blessing. You have the DNA of God. Shall I keep going on this? You have uh, every uh, privilege, right, and authority that Jesus Christ has given to all of his saints. You have been given the gl most glorious inheritance. You're a co-signer to the title deed of the universe. You're a joint heir of Jesus. You are co-seated, co-reigning with him, co-exalted. You're the look-alike bride. You're the lovely partner of the Son of God. You are everything his heart's desire, his life, his essence, his power. You are one with the the three in one. That's pretty awesome. And that's just the introduction. It goes more. There, there's a glory that's in us. Not a small, tiny bit as a seed, but the fullness of Christ as the man of glory. Christ in me is the hope of glory. Can you imagine if this glorious hope began to compel us and move us and motivate us to minister, to touch, to preach, to speak, to love, to, to show acts of service and kindness and, and justice and mercy to the hurting on this planet. The Christ in us right here in this room is enough. Somebody please say, that's right. You are a fire starter. And God is moving you from being a needy person that comes into the room and says, there's something I really need tonight. To becoming somebody who is a dispenser that says, I'm coming into the room to give tonight. There's something I'm going to release tonight. There's something I'm going to pour out tonight. And we come in the room and we don't immediately default to the inward cocoon of our own self and flesh and our own minds and our, the drama, the soap opera in our head and start living in this realm. Instead, we come out of our beds in the morning. We come out of that cocoon every day and we express this glorious hope. There's a fire in you, my friend. It's not a tiny, you know, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. Dude, my spark, uh, it, 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 the fire is going. The fire is going. It's about to consume me. I can't wait to go up in the flames. I can't wait to be fully consumed because Hebrews chapter 1 says that he makes his messengers flames of fire. It's taken from the book of Psalms. He makes his messengers flames of fire. Your destiny is the fire. Every single person in here is destined for fire. You get to pick which kind. I don't want that kind. I want the real kind. I want the good kind. I don't want the, you know, the judgment fire. I want the glory fire. Is that all right? Everybody say it out loud. I am a fire starter. You are destined for something greater than having a good week, going on a good vacation, you know, making your retirement nice and fat and comfortable. Our destiny is so much greater on earth than that. We have the authority to light the fires of God wherever we walk. You are a bucket of bliss ready to spill out on other people. You are a container of the Christ that dispenses eternal life and glory and righteousness with every word you speak. You're a wine barrel filled with new wine. You are a river of living water. You are a, a river of praise, a river of overcoming strength. Christ in you is the river of holiness and happiness. Don't live in the old covenant reality that is external. The new covenant reality is ours in Christ. The cup of covenant love that he gave to his disciples the last night he was on earth before he was to be crucified. That cup of covenant love is now ours as the, as the radiant bride, the perfect match for the Son of God. He gives us that very cup of covenant and we now enter in. You remember Jesus said when he gave them, he said, I will not drink this cup again until I drink it with you in the kingdom of God. Guess what? We're in the kingdom of God and we're drinking that cup. We drink it inside. We drink of this cup of covenant love and glory. He's drinking it now. It's the Lord's table. He drinks it with us every time we partake. And spiritually, he feasts with us even as we feast with him. You are his banqueting table. 
You're the feasting place, the trysting place where Christ comes to his lovers and within our very spirit, he gives us himself and dispenses his life into us. And in the dream, I was teaching and I wrote this one down too. It's really, it's crazy, you know, right, taking notes on you preaching in a dream, okay? But I, I was speaking on weakness, that weakness is irrelevant, that God never, that weakness is irrelevant in the kingdom of God. If, if you look hard enough, that's kind of all he has with us. But weakness in God's eyes is irrelevant. He doesn't fixate on your weak spot. He doesn't look at all the flaws and the foibles and the stumbles and tumbles. He doesn't, he's not consumed with those weaknesses. But he uses those as expressions of grace, as the expressions of his overcoming life, of his victory. The woman caught in adultery, you know, in John 8. I bet you don't know this. That chick had a name. That girl had a name. You want to know what her name was? This has been sanitized throughout church history. I don't even know if, if, if my buddy Nick knows this, but he's going to take notes on it, I bet. But she had a name. Her name was Potini. P-H-O-T-I-N-I. -I. You can look it up like I did and do some due diligence to research this out. I'm, I was translating John 8, and I said, well, this girl had to have a name. This woman, you know, which isn't it interesting, the woman was caught in adultery. Uh, adultery is kind of hard by yourself. I'll let you do the math on that. But, uh, you know, there's some even that went so far as said it was one of the, one of the, the guys in, that was picking up the stones was one of them. But anyway, her name Potini, P-H-O-T-I-N-I. -I. I know it sounds kind of like a pasta dish to me, but Potini, she became one of the great apostles. I said apostles. A woman apostle. You look it up. You do your research. She was numbered among the twelve. She was a city reacher. When you reach your city for Jesus, then you will go down in church history as a, as a great apostle of the faith as well. But this woman was, the, was one of the greatest evangelists of all time ever. And she even led uh, royalty to Jesus Christ. Uh, I believe it was Nero's brother that she led to Christ. And he, Nero got so incensed over that, that his own brother converted to Christianity, that, that he had her... Uh, arrested and thrown into prison and eventually martyred. But she goes down in church hi history as this great woman evangelist, Potini. You ought to look her up. What's my point? God will take the weakness, the brokenness, the frailties of our lives. Your weakness is a prophecy of the next place God will break through for you. Weakness never interferes with God's plan. Never. Never. Because he overrides that. He, he attaches himself to our weakness. And, and the effervescence of his life takes us where we cannot go without him. It's our strengths that turn him aside. It's our strengths, our pride-filled strengths that, that tend to resist and keep his grace from fully flowing through our lives. So I, I know there's nobody weak in this room. But if you were to be a weak person... If you were to have, uh, you know, not a perfect resume spiritually, I'm telling you the good news tonight that Jesus Christ, His glory, and the new covenant reality that burns from within us, it, it's irrespective of whatever weakness you may feel. This is really good news. Well, you're one of the sons of golden oil. Zechariah 4 speaks of these sons that are like pipes of fresh oil, sources of oil that, that are olive trees. The sons of oil are coming to the nations. Sons of oil. What are these sons of oil? They're men and women filled with grace and truth. And they, they provide the anointing and the substance of life for the people of God. So instead of coming and gathering this week it, consumed with a need... God's going to meet those needs. As you bring your unsaved friends and family tomorrow, you're going to see miracles. As you see the, the, the sick healed and the hurting healed, 
You're going to see with your eyes the God of glory as He touches his, the hearts of His people. He loves His people. But folks, instead of coming in, in this place of it's about me, we come and say, no, I am a container. I am a dispenser. I am a golden pipe. I'm a son of oil. It's going to flow through me. I'm going to provide the oil in this meeting. I'm going to provide the oil for the lampstand of the church in the last days. Still with me? Why don't you say it again? I am a fire starter. The Jesus that you love inside of you is the hope of glory. Your cup is running over. Your wine barrel is full. Your lampstand is lit. You're a fountain of refreshment every time you step into the room. You no longer see yourself as the needy. You begin to see yourself as the blessing that the city needs, that what Greenwich really needs, what Westchester County really needs is more of you, of the Christ in you being released through your uh, visible expression. God wants to put skin on. You're it. You're going to be that living expression. The hope of glory is enough. God doesn't want to refurbish you. He wants to revive you. He's not just making you over. He's revealing the Christ that's within you. He wants to make you a fire starter. As a container of this supernatural power, you can do the works of Jesus. You can even exceed those works because John 14, 12 says, as mature sons come forth who believe in me, Jesus says, they're going to do the works that I do, but they're going to do even greater works that I do because I'm going to go and intercede for the full flow of the spirit life, the full flow of God life, of the triune God pouring out his glory to the earth. And because of that, the mature sons and daughters are going to do even greater works. Any believers here? I mean, can you believe these things? We're speaking the mysteries of God, but they're so true and they need to be received and appropriated tonight. Uh, you eat at his table and you're, you're, you drink from his river. You move in his spirit. You conquer in his power. You flow in his glory. You ignite others with his fire. You're a valve that's about to be opened. A volcano that's about to blow. You're a faucet that will be released. And a fountainhead ready to overflow. You're about to make the jump from prayer to proclamation. From pursuing to overtaking. From intimacy to sacred union. Where two become one. The Christ in you is going to win the battle of your mind. He's going to win those uh, ambivalent, uh, duplicitous ways in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our lifestyles. The temptations are going to seem like, like futile attempts of the enemy to thwart the full flow of Christ's life within us. When Christ fully dredges that channel through our spirit being, I'm telling you, there's nothing that gonna, is going to hinder the Christ life from overcoming. Jesus is going to give you His glory, my friend. He's going to pour out of you. He's going to seep through you. He's going to come right out of your pores. He's going to come right out of your words. He's going to come out of your hands. He's going to come out of your eyes as you look at others. He's going to come out of every part of your being because the Christ in you is the glorious hope. You know, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says that, that God will never share His glory with another, right? It says that I am God and I will not share my glory with another. But you're not another. You're one with Him. You are one with Him. In the New Covenant, He shares His glory with you. In John 17, read it with your own eyes. He says, Father, the glory you have given me, I share it with them. Because they're not another, because we are one, even as you and I are one, so they are one with me. And in, the, in that oneness realm, in the life union of the Christ life within us, the glory that Jesus has, you have tonight. I mean, this is like face slapping, like sober me up reality here. Gosh, Jesus, I have the same glory, uh-huh. You look at that weird person next to you, you see the flaw, you see the failure, you see where they hurt you, something that they did or didn't do. Jesus says, you don't know. They're the container of my glory. They're the vessel that is going to awaken the cities of the earth. We stop looking at one another in the eyes of the flesh when we see this glory, when we taste this glory. 
The fire he wants to light in Greenwich this week is the fire of his glory. There's nothing wrong with you that the glory burst could not cure, that, that could, could heal and could satisfy. The yearning of your heart isn't to have a church service or to have a ministry. The longing of your heart is to have the fullness of Christ throbbing and pulsating through every moment of your existence on this earth until you shed this, this skin and suddenly you receive the eternal reward of oneness with Him to become one for eternity. And in this glorious mystery of Christ within us, we, we are enthused with His power. We are, we are filled with His anointing and His grace. There's nothing you do not have in Christ. It's all been given to you. Uh, you know, I look at it, you know, like, like God is saying, you know, if I didn't spare Jesus, what's everything else to me? If I gave you my most prized, glorious, precious possession, my very own Son, if I yielded Him up for you to pierce and nail on a tree, what's everything else to me? What do you want? Life? Angels? Eternity? Power? Grace? Your family to come to Christ? Ask of me, I'll give you nations. What do you need? You see, if I've given you Jesus, everything else gets thrown in on top of it. It says, He that spared not His own Son, will He not also with giving His Son, will He not also give us all things? All things are yours. Life, death, principalities, powers, destiny, purpose, release, satisfaction. Tell me one thing you do not have in Jesus Christ. And hunger is that activating key. Hunger is the master key. Passion is what unlocks eternity for us. A revival 2.0 is coming. A revival that will make Pentecost look like a picnic is about to hit harvest time. It was only Mother's Day one year ago that your pastor met Jehovah Zappa right up here on the platform. There was a fireball that came flashing through the room and my wife and I were having a rare time off in, in, in Kona. Somebody had to. And he calls me and says, you got to come, Brian. The, the glory, the fire is falling at harvest time. We made our way back. We came after a few days of those meetings. We jumped right in, as you'll remember. And we experienced such precious, wonderful, powerful anointings. As you all and, and myself, all of us for those weeks, we yielded our heart. We laid our lives down. Now return to that first love. Come back to the first love passion for Jesus. Jesus said, repent and go back and do those first works. I wonder if that was a, a primer, if that was a test, if he was not just alluring us to see if harvest time would really go with him all the way into this abandoned flame, in the surrender of the flames. God's going to light a fire here in Greenwich and in this church. Yes, you're going to get the new building. Yes, you're going to have a breakthrough in every single way. High schools are going to come trembling to Jesus Christ. Uh, universities and college campuses from uh, New York to into Connecticut, all along this border, they're going to come streaming in. There's going to be people coming with cameras to take pictures and film and video and interview what God is going to do in this house. I'm telling you, the destiny of harvest time you got a taste of it 18 months ago or 16 months ago. But now he's going to bring the raw, real, the true. It's going to make Pentecost look like a, 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 Pentecost, uh, like a picnic. <laughs> Carriers of the glory are going to be released. Mass harvest breaking loose on the streets in unprecedented proportions. We've got to... We got to go, man, I'm telling you, Philip, we need you in this harvest. We need the young men and young women like me into this harvest field. Violent shakings, tremblings, the fear of God falling in a 50 mile radius at the detonation point centers in as a bullseye upon the shoreline, upon uh, Greenwich right here and along the shoreline up to a new haven and down to the Big Apple. God is going to encircle NYC with G-O-D. He's going to put His glory around this city. 
Powerful demonstrations of the kingdom of Christ will be displayed in all of heaven's fury. Multitudes of souls, like a stampede, like an avalanche, are going to come to know Jesus Christ. Millions in our nation are going to be converted by the intoxicating glory of His presence. It's coming to America. It's coming to Connecticut, New York, and it's coming to the Northeast Corridor. I'm telling you, this is the new Bible Belt. The buckle's moving north. I know it. I burn with it. He told me. He said, revival's coming to the Northeast. You are going to be a part of it. He told me over 20 years ago. And that's why we left the jungle and found our way up here into this part of the country. Because I know God is saying, I'm going to send the sword of my glory, the sword, the burning sword of fire is going to strike this region. Slicing off the darkness forever. And imparting this glory that cannot be contained by a church, a person, a preacher, a movement. It's going to be greater than anything. It's like the book of Acts and the book of Exodus put together times 10. That's what's coming. All of the miracles of judgment and glory are going to mingle. Which is it? Judgment or glory? The answer is yes. They're both coming. You get to pick which one you're going to be a part of. But there's fire going to fall in Connecticut this week. There is fire that's going to fall. I mean, we've seen so many signs and wonders. We've seen so many miracles, earthquakes that came when we, when we challenged the forces of darkness. In, uh, actually, in, in Hawaii, we prophesied earthquake would come. In Korea, same thing. I'm telling you, balls of fire are going to become commonplace. It's like he's emptying the altar of heaven onto the earth. Like he's hurling down to the earth. Like the angel of Revelation 15 and Revelation 8 that's hurling down these coals of fire to the earth. Get your catcher's mitt on. And catch one of these. God wants to ignite you. You are made to burn. You are highly flammable. You are combustible. You're made for this. Everybody say, I am a fire starter. Burn me holy. Well, he's going to. The presence revival is what I call it. It's the presence revival. It's the bride's revival. It's the presence of the Lord that's going to fall. It's not just really good worship. There may be times where nobody has the strength to even pluck a string. I'm telling you, when God comes, the proudest of men become dead on the ground. They become flattened by the pride, kissing the carpet, and can't hardly move. It's like an elephant came and sat on your, your, your chest. The glory is coming. The fear of God is coming. The presence, revival, is going to touch Connecticut. You've come tonight because you want the real. You want the pleasing fire, the fragrant sacrifice of Christ. You want that that fragrance of His flame. You want that upon you. I'm telling you, you're going to get everything you wanted and a whole lot more. I like to tell people what I see coming. And I had a 10-day visitation where I saw with dreams and visions that seemed to just go on a serial fashion over and over. Wake up and get a vision. Go to bed and have a dream that picked up where the vision left off. For 10 days, I saw meetings like this where people had to be drug out of the room because of the thousands and hundreds the hundreds and perhaps thousands that were out there waiting to get in. We didn't have catchers. We had draggers. <laughs> we're going to have a whole new, you know, servant ministry field. The whole, whole suit, you know, sign up and be a dragger. <laughs> Come into our drag ministry. No, never mind. Our dragger ministry. Oh, Jesus, help me, Lord, help me. Fresh life is on the way. Unprecedented intensity. You know, unprecedented. I mean, you, you don't know it all. I know that's hard to imagine, but you really don't know it all. Now, tell the person next to you, you've been wanting to do this all your life. Tell the person next to you, you don't know it all. <laughs> you see, we, there's so little we know. We're, we're overly familiar with a God we barely know. We claim a, a knowledge of things that we... we are at superficial at best. We get a drop of God and call it the ocean when we don't realize we just got a thimbleful. Wait until your cup overflows, bro. 
Wait until you can't take anymore. You get under the Niagara Falls, under the cascading glory. When, when that happens, you, you become clean. You become fresh. Your conscience comes alive. You know, your favorite sins get discarded in the trash. You no longer keep up the disgusting habits, the hidden things that d dilute the Christ's glory within you. And instead, you cherish His presence. This is a presence revival that's coming. This is cherishing and holding the presence. How vain would it be to have cocky, arrogant preachers standing up, strutting across the platform when the glory of God falls. All of us, the mountain of pride will melt like wax when His glory comes into the room. It's coming. The burning, shaking presence of the Lord. Extreme faith erupting from the the very depths of God's people. The meek will become bold and the bold will become full of power. It will make some begin to think as though Jesus had come back when His disciples arise with power, sons of oil, mighty ones who do His bidding, Joel's army, Shulamite lovers. Folks, the Bible is full, full of prophecy about what's coming. I'm going to kick your doom and gloom right out of here. I'm telling you, I don't care about politics. It's not a matter who's in the White House, bro. It's who's in God's house. And last time I checked, he's ruling from on high. The, the glory of the Lord covers the whole earth. It, it fills the whole earth. Isaiah, all he could pronounce was woes until he had a throne room visitation. And until you get into that visitation of the throne room, that's all you have to do is point your finger and say these wicked this and those wicked Republicans and those wicked Democrats. Oh, yeah? Isaiah said, woe is who? Yeah. And in that divine place of revelation, he was sent with the message. Even those people's hearts would be hard. Even though his message would even dull their hearts further. God said, go. You will be my servant of fire. And Isaiah understood in that wonderful encounter that it was God plus nothing. And as God filled his heart and the glory poured through him, Isaiah was a historical figure of biblical proportions. You're about to become a giant killer. You're going to take the sword of your enemy and cut off his head. You're going to have David's dance, David's passion, David's heart, David's anointing, David's power, David's prayer life. You're going to have David's worship gift. You're going to experience the Davidic realm of entering into this heart set free of Dabi, a heart on fire, the passion of Christ in us. I don't know much, but I know this. I've never known God to use a man or woman with no passion. Whether it's sports, business, finance, family, whether it's any field of activity, education, medicine, you name it, your, put your field, your career in this, whatever you're involved in, it is men and women with passion that shape the future. It's, it's passion that moves the earth. It's passion. There are people in rooms tonight that are planning and hoping for the downfall of our nation. They're hoping and planning for the destruction, for the harm. There are Satanists, there are Luciferians, there are witches, there are men of darkness, and they're, they're convening all over the planet with their schemes to do what's evil. God sits in the heavens and laughs. When He makes bare His mighty arm and the steel punch of God pierces all of the darkness, He's going to enthrone His mighty Son on Zion's glory. And there's going to be the scepter giving to us. And we're going to rule and we're going to reign. Now, with that introduction, Psalm 8. I had to work out a few things there. I really like this psalm. <clears throat> psalm 8. Great and powerful is your name, O Lord, our Lord. People everywhere see your majesty. Your glory streams from the heavens, filling the earth with the fame of your name. You've built a stronghold by the songs of babies. Strength rises up with the chorus of singing children. This kind of praise has the power to shut Satan's mouth. Childlike worship will silence the madness of those who oppose you. Look at the splendor of your skies. Your creative genius glowing in the heavens. 
when I gaze at your moon and your stars mounted like jewels in their settings, I know you are the fascinating artist who formed it all. But when I look up and see such wonder and workmanship above, I have to ask you, God, this question. Compared to this cosmic glory, why would you bother with puny, mortal man? Or pay any attention to Adam's sons? Yet what honor you have given to us, created only a little lower than Elohim. This word has been translated incorrectly in many of your translations, probably 90%, or maybe 99%. The word is Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. How does it feel to be created just a little bit lower than Elohim? Okay, ushers, let, let's lock the doors. Don't let anybody out until we get this. Okay? I'm going to say it one more time. How does it feel that you would be created way above angels? You are not created lower than the angels. You are created a little lower, little lower than Elohim. Man, that will ruin your depression right there. I mean, that, that would just wreck your pity party. To, to know that you have been crowned with glory and honor. You've been kissed by divine dust and deity have mingled into one. That you are one with the triune God. That when God looks at you, He doesn't see a problem or a project. He sees a partner and a passionate lover. The image maker embedded Himself into you into your DNA, into your bone marrow, into the chromosomes of your very being. And then with blood, He sealed the, the transaction. And now sacred blood has washed you even cleaner than the whitest white on this planet. The glory of Christ is in you. You have become the manger. You carry like Mary. You have become the container, the vessel. You are the dispenser of the divine into your nation and into the, your city. You've been created just a little bit lower. Crowned like kings and queens with glory and majesty as lords of creation, you've delegated to them mastery over all you have made, making everything subservient to their authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. Go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter 2. This passage is quoted in Hebrews 2. I think it's verse 6. There's a place where someone has testified. The place is Psalm 8. The someone is David. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. Now, are you sitting down? Okay. You need to check this out because I love it when people check it out and they go, you were right, Brian. Pastor Brian, you were right. Check me out. Check me out. Let me tell you. The Greek adds a tense. The Septuagint quotation here adds a tense in the verb that isn't a little lower than Elohim. It's a little while lower than Elohim. He brings many sons to glory. You are in the process of being brought to glory. And by the grace of God tonight, you are going to encounter the glory. You're going to encounter being brought to glory. It says He brings many sons. Everybody say, bring me. Bring me. Yeah, He brings many sons to glory. 
Let me get to that passage so you don't think I'm making it up. And it quotes virtually Psalm 8 with that added tense. It says, you crowned him with glory and honor, put everything under his feet, and putting everything under his feet, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus. We see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels or the messengers and now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So by the grace of God, he would taste death for everyone. If he tasted it for everyone, then you don't need to walk in the death realm any longer. You don't need to have your hope dead, your faith dead, your, your passion dead, life dead. He's given us the reigning in life grace, a grace that enables us to reign as kings in life. That's the word used in Romans 8, uh, Romans 5, uh, uh, yeah, Romans 5, to reign in life. Isn't that great? Six. I'll get it straight. Somewhere between five and eight in Romans, it's there. I, I'm so like consumed with Acts and John and Proverbs, and, but uh, we'll get there. I can't wait to do Romans. Now it says in verse 10, you still here? Now in verse 10 it says, He brings many sons to glory. And it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. But the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them what? Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother. Now, let's, let's not only make it uh, gender inclusive, but let, let's go back and make it, let's connect some dots here. Psalm 8, he's made you a little bit lower than the God who created the universe. And then it says, for a little while, in Hebrews 2. And then it says that we're his sons. That Jesus, uh, you, you know what? I know this is kind of crazy to get into this at midnight tonight here, but um, time flies when you have fun, but it, it says that we're sons. We're sons of Jesus. How does it feel to be sons of Jesus? Uh, isn't that strange? A strange theology? Yeah, you ought to rebuke Jesus for saying that, huh? No. It says He brings many sons to glory. We are His sons. And in the book of Revelation, twice it calls us His sons. Now, Isaiah 9 says that he's the everlasting father. Well, to be a father, you have to have sons, man. You've got to have daughters. You've got to have some offspring. So Jesus has an offspring. You know where he gave birth to them? Um, well, what, moms, what, what comes forth when a child is born? What accompanies that baby? What comes forth from the womb? Is it blood and water? Your water breaks in blood and water. And, okay. What came forth from Jesus' womb when he was pierced? Blood and water. He gave birth to his bride. He gave birth to his sons. He's the everlasting father. He gave birth at the cross. It was the labors and the travail of his soul. And he literally gave birth to the sons of oil, the sons of God. He brings many sons to glory. And as his sons, he furthermore says, not only are we his sons, but now we're his brothers. Isn't it interesting the metaphors and the analogies that the scriptures use to try to pop the light of revelation into our hearts? Sons brought to glory. A bride brought to his side. Brothers that enjoy everything that our older brother enjoys. Wow. Mature sons are coming. Sons who know the love of their father. They will love him with their whole hearts. They'll be his willing servants. But they know the love of their father. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that should keep you back from the fresh revelation of, of how deeply your father loves you. You have the perfect father. And he expresses that by giving you the perfect Savior. And he sent the Spirit to be a perfect 
expression. It's interesting, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it says that he's the down payment. The Holy Spirit is the, the, the earnest, the pledge, the, the down payment, which is actually the Greek word used for engagement ring. The Holy Spirit is the engagement ring. Guess what's coming? I mean, when, when that guy plops a rock, on, it puts a ring on it, baby. When he puts a ring on it, and it, it's a big one, you know it's probably going to work out. I mean, you're going to have a lot less problems than before you met that guy. The bigger the rock, it's going to be exciting. Okay, we'll just leave it at that. You got that little fleck, you know, well, it can, it'll, it'll turn, it'll turn around. God will work it out. But when Jesus says, here's my engagement ring, it's the Holy Spirit that seals you as my bride-to-be, that seals you for eternity as the perfect match. You know, I went on jharmony.com and I filled out the profile and, and, I, and you popped up. You are the one I set my heart on from eternity. You're everything I've always wanted. You're all I want. We sing, Lord, you're all I want, all I need. He says, you don't understand. You're all I want. You're all I need. The longing of his heart. It's not good for the Son of Man to be alone. And he longs for this partnership. And I'm telling you, mature lovers, mature sons are coming. They're not going to doubt the love of God. They're not going to always struggle to make God like them and to, you know, to draw attention and to use ministry to validate and, and, and to try to pull illegally from the hearts of people to find their own uh, deficit met in, in their heart and in their emotions. But instead, they're going to be strong, content. They're going to be filled as vessels of love, they're going to be able to express that perfect love to other people that will never fail to point them to Jesus Christ. Mature sons are coming. Sons of love are coming. And by the spiritual process of this relationship with Jesus, He in us and we in Him, then we will become sons of God. We will become lights in this dark world. We will become shining lamps. As I prayed during the worship, I saw the constellations, I saw the stars, I saw the beauty of the night sky that you rarely can see with all the lights here. But I'm telling you, uh, you are the stars. You are the beautiful stars that puncture the darkness in this dark world. And He extends you as His love gift to the nations. You are the dispenser. You are the container. You carry the Christ. You carry like Mary. Everything He is, is your future. Everything you love about Jesus will one day be spoken over your life. Your destiny is to be fully a fully counterpart match, a perfect match to the Son of God. Isn't that awesome, folks? With no struggle, with no uh, you know, uh, obsession over our weaknesses, with no backward glance, with no striving to be somebody apart from Him. With all of that out of us, with the Jacob life fully exposed, the Israel within us can rise and be a prince with God. The great deselfing of the church has begun and He's emptying and draining like dirty oil from our churches. He's draining out that which has expired and no longer is pure. And He's refilling the church with fresh, oil, sons of oil, burning ones, glorious ones, fiery ones that will become winds of fire to the nations of the earth. Beloved ones, I'm here to tell you, you are a fire starter. Just soak a little bit more in the oil. Get some of that hard, brittle stuff off of you. And watch the tenderness of the Christ within come forth as the soaking of oil takes place. And then somebody like me is going to come around with a blowtorch. <laughs> and we're going to let you burn. Your destiny, your destiny is to burn bright for this nation. Your calling is to be the fervent one. Never lose your zeal. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Fan into flame the gift that is within you. What gift is in us but the Christ of glory? The fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Him, and the fullness of Him dwells in me. Do the math, folks. We are 
full of Jesus Christ. Stop thinking about what you don't have and start proclaiming and rejoicing in what you do have. Become the see-through servant, the aquarium with Jesus inside. Be that man, that woman that, that, that will release something in the atmosphere over the messed up family, the dysfunctional workplace, the difficult uh, co co-worker. Release an atmosphere over that because the full-grown Jesus now lives in you. You are beautiful. You are His beautiful look-alike. Everything you adore about Jesus is one day going to be said over you because He's bringing many sons into glory and daughters when I use sons, please don't, don't email me. I mean daughters. I mean, I, I had one person just really got on me about it. And I said, well, you know, why, why don't you ask God why, he call, why Jesus is the son of God? Anyway. No, I'm not one of those weird male guys. Well, maybe I am, but not as you think. But I'm telling you, daughters of Zion, lovely daughters of Zion, and the mighty sons that do his bidding, let me tell you, he's going to bring you to glory. Wouldn't it be awesome that tonight, as we come up front here in just a second, that we actually get confronted with the glory of God? The breathtaking splendor that, that exceeds all that we could, you know, you could, you could empty out into the, you could empty the world out into language and it would still not be enough to speak forth, to tell of his wonders, of the books that should be written, of the glory that ought to be described for the people of God. I'm really enjoying this. I'm glad I came tonight. Let's give Jesus a hand. He is so good. I'm getting just a little bit tipsy here. Whoo! Some of you could use a little bit of this. Really. Thank you. Mm. Good to see you, Linda. How are you? You want to come to Israel with us? Could you come? Did I mention about going to Israel? You guys should come with us. Nick's coming. Yeah, October, there's actually there's just a few seats left and, and uh, not much time to get signed up and everything, but you can come. There's lots of, lots of energy. You've always wanted to go, so don't put it off. Uh, you know, Israel's really probably, Jerusalem's probably the safest place on the earth. You know that? Because God himself keeps watch over it. And, and a billion Christians pray for its safety. I mean, honestly, it's safer than the Merritt Parkway, bro. It really is. So don't get this, oh, Israel, they're going to kill me. They're going to bomb me. No. You're going to meet the resurrected, glorious Christ. You're going to be on the, on the dirt with me as we have communion at the empty tomb. Grant, you're coming with me. Grant Berry, wonderful man of God. He's coming with us, reconnecting with all the roots of your life. And we're going to learn together. We'll learn from you. And we'll just be blessed. It's going to be really good. He brings many sons to glory. Hey, did I tell you my wife had a dream last night about what I just taught? Yeah. She wrote it out at 2 in the morning. And I got up. It went into her office, uh, the bathroom there, and, and uh, she had it written out. She has paper and pen where she writes her dreams out. And I go in there and I look at that and it says, He made us a little lower than Elohim. Didn't you have that on? Yeah. God gave that to you in a dream? Yeah. You see how we operate? John 5 19, you see what the Father's doing and you do what that is. So, 
I wasn't going to tell you, but I just thought I'd add that in there. Let's, uh, let's go to heaven. Can you do some bring many sons into glory songs and we're all going to get raptured into heaven right now and the, get clothed in the realm of glory? That kind of worship stuff? Okay. He knows what I mean. Okay, you can all come on down and I think we're going to pray over some people if that's okay. It's, it's, about, uh, it's about five to nine. I guess I went a little longer than I, I should have, could have, would have. But uh, if you can handle it, I'd like to have you come up and we'll just see what God does. Oh, oh Jesus. Ah. On, let it come out of your innermost being, your passion. Show me your love. What you really long for. If you could just see it and taste. Show me your glory. Put your garment of glory over me. Show me your glory. Open my eyes, Lord. Put on that engagement ring. You're destined for the glory. On the face of the world. Come on.
let it rain and open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. Fire. Uh, Fire. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain.
Take it. Take more. Take more. Receive it. Receive the glory kiss of heaven. Pow. There it is. Standing in your presence. Here we are. Standing in your presence. Shekinah glory come down. Shekinah glory. Drink it in. Give it more. More for my daughter. Come on, everybody under a hundred, let's sing it. Release the fullness. Release the fullness. The fullness, Lord. The fullness.
may still be online, so I just want to speak to those that are watching online from around the nations. God's glory is visiting you. Come on, get soaked, saturated, marinated, filled with the oil of God. Oil, sons of oil, daughters of oil. And then let the fire come. It will be flaming ones. Too hot to handle people are coming into the church. And you're going to be one of those. You are a fire starter. Amen. Thank you. Pastor Nick, save a little juice for tomorrow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just show our appreciation, Pastor Brian, for that awesome word. I, I think we're fire starters, amen? We want to just, you know, we don't think to do this all the time, but I want you to just stretch out your hands just for one moment to Pastor Brian and Pastor Candace. I'm not sure where she is, but if you're nearby, Sister Candace, you could just lay a hand on her. Father, thank you so much for your choice servants, Lord God. And we just pray, Lord, just unlimited measures of your joy, your peace, your refreshing into them, Father. Lord, I thank you that you've already been giving them heavenly downloads, Lord. And I thank you that you're going to just keep bringing uh, good bread, Lord God, out of this brother's spirit to us across these next few nights and days, Lord God. So I pray, Father, for visitations during the night season, Lord, just as he shared about, uh, Lord, how you spoke to Candace in the night. I pray, God, that while they're resting, Lord, they'll have divine encounters in your presence as well, Lord. Thank you for Brian and Candace, Father. We love them. We appreciate them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm going to ask the team if they'll just, uh, just continue to minister to the Lord in worship. And you can just sit before the Lord. You can just find a spot up here if you want to just sit. The band will play for just a few minutes more. And you can just love on Jesus a little bit more. Amen. God bless you. And I will see you tomorrow night, Friday night also at 7 and into the weekend as well.